Hi, I'm Kier Graf, and I am here to launch my new middle grade novel, The Tiny Mansion. And I thought, who better to help me celebrate than my friend, mentor, colleague, Eileen, Eileen Cooper. <laughs> Uh, somebody I like to think of as a book whisperer. Eileen is somebody who is directly responsible for my middle grade career. And so uh, thank you for that, Eileen. <laughs> well, you are welcome. And I think we need to toast your new book. And since we both have beverages at the ready. Cheers. Cheers. My champagne glass seemed to kind of take on the ferns behind me for a minute there. <laughs> Yes, you have a you have a very um, uh, interesting background because it has to do a lot with the book. So let's hear a couple of lines about the book. You may think this is a virtual background, Eileen, but you know, rather than than I almost said Skype, rather than zooming you from my apartment in Chicago, I did take Elon Musk's underground, uh, you know, magnetic monorail from O'Hare Airport to Northern California. And it is a marvel. It's just seamless travel. Okay. Uh, I think they should certainly give him the contract to, to do whatever he wants in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a little frightening. <laughs> <laughs> but so, why are you in the Redwoods? So I am in the Redwoods because uh, my heroine finds herself in the Redwoods. Dagmar, the 12 uh, the year old at the heart of this book is, um, like a lot of my protagonists, find, finds herself throwing a curveball kind of early, early in the story. Um, the summer she was hoping for is not the summer she gets as her family suffers a big financial setback and she finds herself crammed into uh, a tiny house with all of them living illegally uh, in, the, in the redwoods of Northern California. And things look pretty boring until she meets uh, the mean boy who lives in the forest next door. Uh, turns out he's the son of a reclusive tech billionaire uh, who's got um, some issues of his own. And I, I don't think I'm pitching it very well here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me say that it is a thrilling book um, because so much happens and, and so much happens in such a, especially the last third of it, it's really like, hold on to the seat of your pants, exciting. So I, I think it's um, a great book and it, it's the third in a trilogy, really, because you're like a house crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> you started with Matchstick Castle and then you went to the Phantom Tower. And now, how did you happen to uh, pick this tiny mansion? Well, this is, this book really, kind of had its genesis in the title, which sounds so silly, but at following the Matchstick Castle on the Phantom Tower, I was looking for uh, another another kind of location to set a kid's book that would be kind of a play on words or, you know, two, two words in opposition to each other, something that would raise questions just from the very title, um, making kids wonder, you know, well, what's that all about? And so I was playing with some some good ideas, some pretty bad ideas. Uh, but when I said the tiny mansion out loud, it just kind of clicked. And then of course, uh, I thought, well, that's great because I'm fascinated with tiny houses. I'm fascinated with really efficient apartments and homes that are put together like jigsaw puzzles. And from there, I had to think about who was going to be living in it and what would be their challenge. And you know, how could I set a whole adventure in and around a tiny house? Because in the Matchstick Castle and the Phantom Tower, there are these very expansive canvases. I mean, the buildings are big and the adventures are big. And so I was kind of shrinking it down in one way, but um, I definitely didn't want to tell a small story. Well, I don't think it's a small story. And I guess what helps is that, that the boy next door lives in an incredible house, quite different, all just as modern and up to date in a creepy kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> as it can possibly be. Did you have to do a lot of research to, to figure out, you know, what would go into a smart house like that? I did a little bit because I'm definitely a fan of old homes and old technology, uh, uh, he says over Zoom. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I did have to do a little bit of research. And, and I also didn't get too specific because in some ways I wanted kids to imagine 
even more things. And I, and I felt like, you know, if I got too detailed on the tech, it almost, I don't know, I almost felt like it would invite um, comparison to real life stuff or take kids out of the story. But basically I, I did want Dagmar's frenemy, Blake, the boy she meets and kind of grudgingly uh, becomes friends with. Uh, I, I wanted him to live in something that was just completely the opposite of her experience. And, you know, a house that was almost like magical and crazy looking. I mean, she describes it as looking kind of like a crumpled aluminum mm -hmm. foil house in the woods. So I was definitely picturing like a Frank Gehry uh, mm -hmm. building, you know, the, uh, the, the band shell from Millennium Park in Chicago or, you know, the, his museum in Bilbao, something like that, but, you know, house sized. Um, now your wife, Mariah, works in architecture. So was she uh, helpful? Did you did you come to her and say how does this work and I definitely go to her when I'm looking for help with vocabulary because I've learned so much about architecture from her over the years just both from her you know we're we're both fans of unusual architecture um and down to the fact that you know we we've lived in buildings and had our kids in buildings based on the architect uh, <laughs> which is a story in itself but um I feel I've learned enough from her to manage a, a middle grade novel, but there's often uh, a moment where my vocabulary fails me. And I just think, well, what is that thing called? Because when you can see it in your head, but you can't exactly, uh, it's hard to look up as, as all kids will tell you when they're trying to, you know, how am I supposed to look up the word to spell it in the dictionary when I don't know what it is? You know, in some ways it can be hard to find the right word. So she understands my grunting and uh, can provide the vocabulary. <laughs> Um, when you were when you were dealing with the tiny house aspect of it, now um, have you ever actually been in a tiny house? Or have, I know you must watch the TV shows about the tiny yeah, houses. I they're, yes. They're uh, I, crazily enough, I don't have any friends with tiny houses, and so I have not never <laughs> not been in. Not that like, unusual, actually. A that real, you <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I guess just crazy for a fan of them, but uh, yeah. So I I haven't been in an actual legit. Thing that's been that is designated a tiny house but uh obviously the the resources out there are, on them are endless and i harbor serious dreams to have my own uh, i think that would be the kind of ideal weekend getaway would be to, to find a little secluded glen somewhere and put a, a tiny wow. house on it you know somewhere within a couple hours of chicago um, and also you know more affordable than a mansion in the woods <laughs> <laughs> so you're not claustrophobic <laughs> No, no. Uh, although I think one of the great things about a tiny house is it kind of drives you outdoors and I love to be outdoors. And um, that's one of the reasons I, I try to have so many uh, kind of natural settings in my kids' books is I'm always encouraging kids to be outside. And I think a weekend house that is small, that's really one of the benefits is it pushes you outside. Now in Dagmar's case, she starts sleeping outside because she does not want to be crammed right. in there with her family and her little half brother. And she's just, uh, so the the house there's not a lot of adventure that takes place in the house until the end of the book and then it definitely does but in the early part of the book the function of the house's smallness is really to kind of push her outside into the big world and find adventure there well i mean there is plenty of adventure outside in the last third of the book <laughs> where it is just one one escape and and run and tragedy uh, near tragedy not near tragedy. tragedy near tragedy yeah um and um when i was reading it i i was thinking the way i write i only like to write dialogue right. i don't i don't like to write any description if somebody somebody has to walk some there somewhere i just say she walked there <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yours is the exact opposite because you are writing in such detail about this chase that's going on, and um, it's fascinating to me. How 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 do you um, write it, rewrite it, look at it a third time, and see what's missing? It's amazing. Uh, before I answer that, I have to say that I think maybe you you are a hard boiled children's writer in your soul. You know, <laughs> like stripped down, uh, short declarative fact, sentences. Man. Yeah. You could, you could write a, the great P.I. novel for fourth graders. I'd love to see it. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it is really, 
you know, for me, the action scenes are the most fun part to write um, because that's when all, all the setup and all the careful character work really pays off. And then you're just getting to let your characters really be true to, to themselves, but in, the, in this exciting moment. And uh, I generally find those scenes pretty easy to write. However, that doesn't mean they're not labor intensive. Um, they, you know, I, I've actually been known to draw scenes. I, I'm a terrible artist, but, you know, I will draw little maps or I will sketch things. Uh, one time I was sitting in a coffee shop with a friend who um, we were waiting for our, to pick our kids up from something and I was working on my manuscript and she saw me drawing. She's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm drawing this scene. It was a scene actually in the Matchstick Castle because it was so hard to explain to readers what was happening that I really had to, to diagram it. So I have, have been known to do that at times, but I've also spent a lot of time writing scripts, play scripts and, and screenplays. And uh, I think that that kind of lends itself to an ability to think visually, which is something I love to do. And if anything, I write so much of that, that what I, I, I really have to pair a lot of it away uh, really? with each successive draft, right? It's, it's rarely, I mean, the things I will add in a later stage include like another twist or another complication. Uh, big complication in this story that I added later was cows, which you know about. Yes, there, there are cows. cows <laughs> the cows make, complicated cows things. A frightening appearance. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, um, yeah, I, 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 I tend to put it all in and then strip it away, strip it away until I can, you know, it's, it almost seems, you know, like it wouldn't be a compliment when people say, oh, I see it like a movie, but really to me, that is the ultimate compliment oh, because, yeah. because they are watching it like a movie in their, as they're reading. Right, which, it, which is an amazing skill to have because um, you, you're doing it with words. Um, I was thinking while I was reading it now, I would be using the same word over and over again. <laughs> they, they went fast, they went very fast. Oh, look at how fast they're going. <laughs> so, uh, how cognizant of the of the wordage were you that you know? There's only so many ways to say, you know, they're yeah. barreling down the highway. Yeah, it's it's so funny. I, I just flash back to uh, my senior writing project when I was in college, and my uh, I was writing this sort of bad dystopian thing, and my my professor said. Wow, well, I certainly never knew there were so many ways to describe gray. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always been really cognizant of trying to avoid uh, you know, word repetition. And, and this is something I think you, you know as well, which is as, a, as an editor, as a former editor, and now I do freelance editing and including manuscripts. Um, I just, uh, when you go over something again and again, those, those words jump out at you. And I think that's really uh, a great reminder to aspiring writers and, and up and coming writers that, that you just have to go over your material repeatedly because when you do, you can't help but see those repeated words and say, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I use the same phrasing, I use the same word, what can I do to, to mix it up? But it's also important not to be dogmatic about it because uh, as my professor uh, teased me for, um, you can call attention to yourself by getting too, um, creative in saying it a different way. Like sometimes it is okay to say gray twice in the same paragraph. <laughs> so it's, it's a balance, but I, I think editorial training has a lot to do with it and just, you know, a dogged, uh, doggedly rereading your own work. There, there is a lot, um, and I, I wanted to know how much you, you were actually consciously thinking about the difference between this, a, a simple life, simplicity, and, and high-tech living. Uh, it's, a, it's a big part of the story, but you don't, the way you write it, 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 it doesn't come out messagey at all. But you, um, you must have had something about that in the back of your mind, that, that, you know, not everything we're doing is necessarily the best, as we forge on. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for saying it wasn't messagey. I definitely feel like kids have uh, amazing antenna for that, you know, and I think that so, so many people write, you know, very didactic children's books that I think kids, kids realize when they're being preached to and, and, uh, you know, I wanted them to get that message authentically. I do feel like I'm, I'm not anti 
technology, despite what I said earlier, I'm just, uh, I, I'm very cautious about technology and I, I worry that um, we've embraced it much more quickly than uh, our human evolution allows us to really um, manage it. And, uh, you know, I, I really, you know, I mean, on a, taking this out of the kind of kid litosphere, you know, I'm somebody mm -hmm. who's worried about the surveillance state and I'm worried, I'm worried about, you know, the just kind of uh, loss of privacy that, that we all have, have, you know, kind of collectively participated in. And so I don't want to preach to kids about that. Um, they're going to grow up in a very different world than I grew up in, and they're, it's not going to be possible for them to grow up in the world that I did. But I do just want people to think about kind of what's essential and what, what you need for happiness. And, you know, like all, like all parents, you know, you just hope somehow to get that message across that, to kids that, uh, you know, you don't need a screen in front of you to be happy or, you know, it's fine to use your screen sometimes, but sometimes you've got to be out in the, the real world and, and encountering real people and solving tactile problems and things like that. Because I think that that does build resilience and, and ultimately the grit that we want our kids to have. Right in the redwood forest, just like just like you are at, at, at this moment. <laughs> just like I am. It's amazingly still. There's not even a, a, a hint of a breeze here in the Redwood Forest. <laughs> not even a cricket. No. Now, <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough, I've got the crickets on mute using technology. So Eileen, uh, I, I think you have a little publication news to share as well. I do. Thank you for saying that. Um, my book, A Woman in the House and Senate, has just been revised and updated. And we put a couple of new people on the cover, including Nancy Pelosi and Tammy Duckworth. And, you know, it, it's, it's got a ton of information in it, but it, it's not just the stories of all these individual women who've served in the House and Senate, but it's set against a backdrop of American history so you get to know why each woman was Im important during her time um, and what she did in Congress. And um, so, you know. It could not be more timely. That is a, 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 an essential book and, and, and just at the exact right moment. I, I think so too. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I, I'm glad that it's 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 been revised and updated. So you know, there's an even broader, a broader sense of of who's been there and 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 what's what they've done. Well, I hope that beautiful cover entices a lot of kids to pick it up, and I hope the book itself inspires a lot of young girls to run for office yeah. because we need them. We sure do. We sure do. Well. well I think it was lovely to converse. Can we have another sip of our drink? <laughs> Absolutely. Why not? Thank you so much for joining me, Eileen. It's just uh, always a pleasure to see you. I look forward to seeing you in person again. <laughs> yes, that would be, that would be lovely. Um, we hope that happens soon. And good luck with the Tiny Mansion. It is going to be just as popular as its two brothers or sisters. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it's it's a great addition to the housing to the housing market. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. that, you like is, that? <laughs> can 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 we get a blurb built around that? A great I addition think, to the housing market. <laughs> I think that I think we can. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Eileen. Okay. Thanks. Great to see you. Bye.